Blog Talk Radio. Good evening, folks. Welcome to the Ed Boston Podcast for Tuesday night, the 17th day of November in the year 2015. want to turn around and say hello to my friends over there on on the um, Periscope app, doing a simulcast tonight. And so howdy there. I uh, don't do that very often, but this, this is going to be a big show tonight, folks. It's going to be a big show. So um, the... Uh, the title, the, uh, the what I'm calling tonight's show is Paris, ISIS, and the Evil of Islam. So if you know people that would be interested in that topics, uh, go ahead and let them know. You can uh, find us at uh, blogtalkradio.com forward slash Ed Boston, blogtalkradio.com forward slash Ed Boston, and then you'll hear all of the audio there for you Periscope people. I'm probably not going to do the entire two-hour show, so um, I'm going to switch off a little bit. I want to thank you for being with me here tonight. You can find all my information, edboston.com, uh, all of our um, social media, all the different places you can find our, our podcast. Uh, all of it is uh, there at edboston.com. Uh, love to have you there. If you need to email me, my email address, ed at edboston.com. Uh, questions, comments, concerns, gripes, praises, anything that you would like to uh, send, I'll be happy to listen to what you've got to say. May agree with you, may not agree with you, but hey, that is life, isn't it? Let's go to the Lord in prayer, folks, as we get ready to uh, talk about these topics. Father God in heaven, I come to you just now, and I lift up our friends over in France. Father, 129 victims are dead, a few hundred others injured. As we'll hear in just a few minutes, 20-some of those are in critical condition. We just ask now that you would touch those that were wounded, be with the families of those that were killed. And Father, I pray that you would allow the Holy Spirit to guide us tonight in all of these topics, the topics of the attack in Paris, the topic of the ISIS, and the topic of the evil of Islam. Be with us throughout this show, and I pray this in the holy and precious name of Jesus. Amen. Well, tonight we, we've got two interviews, two big interviews planned. 
Uh, you'll hear the first one here in just a, a few minutes. Marcus Carlson. Hey, there for you Periscope guys. I didn't get it at first, but I got it now. Marcus Carlson uh, will be the first interview. He is the TV anchor from, or one of the TV anchors from France 24, the English speaking part, uh, part of their broadcast team there. And uh, we got some good information. We actually had some breaking news happen while we were in the interview. And that, if we were able to have broadcast that live, which we weren't able to, we actually got that news. And get this, Periscope people. We got that news at least an hour before it broke on Fox News. I'm not kidding you. As we were on with Marcus live from Paris, news was breaking, and I won't share that with you now because I want to sh let that be shared in in the interview. Uh, hour two is going to start. I interviewed Jeff McKinley. I'm sorry, Jeff Kinley. I'm going to have a hard time with that all night because I used to live on McKinley Street a long time ago, and actually it was McKinley Avenue. Uh, <laughs> and I'm going to have a hard time saying Kinley and not McKinley. I interviewed Jeff Kinley author of the new book, Wake the Bride, and the subtitle of that is Revelation, Rapture, Romance, Sleepy Time is Over. We're going to talk about how that reflects upon what happened in Paris and, and the end times prophecy that he goes over in the book of Revelation in his new book. Um, we are... Uh, going to have time in between where I've got a lot of stuff to pack into this two hours. So we're going to get right to uh, the interview with Marcus Carlson. All right. Welcome to this segment of the Ed Boston podcast. And we are privileged to have with us Jeff Kinley. Uh, author of a new I must be so excited that I'm an hour ahead of myself. Let's get back now to Marcus Carlson, not Jeff Kinley. He comes at the start of hour two. All right, welcome to this segment of the Ed Boston Podcast, and we are very pleased and, and honored to have... Uh, Marcus Carlson, a television news anchor from uh, France 24 English Television. Welcome to the show, Marcus. Thank you very much, Ed. And did I get all of that right uh, with the, the name of the um, the company and everything? Of the station, yes, you did. Ev everything was perfect. All right. Well, good. Um, well, first of all, our, our condolences uh, go out to you folks there in Paris uh, over the disaster. Uh, Thank you. And, and terrible tragedy. Uh, I'm sure it's been a busy week for you in, in the news business, hasn't it? Absolutely. Uh, I was on air, actually, uh, when we got the news or when we started getting the news last Friday. And I have to say it's been uh, nonstop since because uh, this is a story that's just kept on developing and it's just... Uh, kept going, so to speak, uh, ever since it's been it's been an intense few days. And what is the latest uh, on the story? What, what were your you just got off the air, correct? Yeah, that, that that's correct. Uh, the latest that we're getting on the story uh, is essentially that uh, uh, well, three French security officials who've spoken to uh, who've spoken to Associated Press say or tell Associated Press essentially that there may. be be another fugitive uh, on the run currently, on top of the uh, fugitive or on top of the suspect that we already knew about, uh, Salah Abdel Salam. Um, so they are saying that an analysis seems to show that another individual, uh, a, a ninth individual essentially, could be involved in the in the attacks. So uh, French authorities, they're racing to presumably find this individual. Uh, at the same time, they're keeping quite tight-lipped. They're not giving out all of the details at this stage because I'm guessing that they may not even know all of the details. They're still keeping an open mind uh, at this point. 
Now, we just talked a second ago off the air. There there was some breaking news uh, related to this. Uh, would you like to share that with our guests? Yeah, sure. This is coming in to us uh, from, from Germany and from the city of Hanover, where there was supposed to be a football match uh, this evening between Germany and the Netherlands, the two national sides. Uh, but they have actually cancelled that football match or at least postponed it uh, just before uh, the football match was supposed to start, to run about an hour and a half be- or so before before the match, I understand, uh, at a time when uh, football fans were actually already coming into the stadium. I'm talking about soccer, by the way, uh, of course, for, <laughs> for your American listeners. Um, and apparently soccer fans, they were already coming into the stadium, but for security concerns or on security concerns, German officials and German police chose to, to postpone it or to cancel this uh, this. Um, this match, and I suppose it shows really how on edge, to a certain extent, uh, France is, or, or other European countries included, uh, how well tense Europe is at this stage. This was an important match because apparently Angela Merkel, the German Chancellor, was supposed to go there as an act of defiance, to a certain extent, to show that we will still assemble, even though we we may have a, a terrorist threat uh, directed against us. So. To, to to cancel this match, I suppose, was, was not something that uh, that German officials really really wanted, but I suppose they took took the safer option. Uh, speaking of that kind of attitude, that we'll we'll assemble and and we're going to go on with life. Um, your everyday citizen on the street are are they doing that? Are they going on with life, or is there a lot of People staying off the streets. Uh, how's that going? Um, yes and no, to, to 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 a certain extent. I mean, it does feel as if Paris is a little bit quieter um, than it is on any normal day. Uh, the metro perhaps has been a little bit quieter. We haven't seen the the the, the turnout on public transport that we would see on any any given day that's a, that's a sense that i get anyway when i when i go to work at the same time schools have reopened again schools and other municipal buildings they were actually shut uh during the weekend or or on saturday uh, and sunday but now they have reopened again so slowly life is coming back to normal uh that being said uh, there is a large security presence in the streets uh, you go past uh, military officers when you take the train, for instance, when you go to train stations, there, there's often a military presence there. You also often see uh, police in the streets with, with, with rifles ready, uh, just just in case, essentially. So you, you do notice the difference that way uh, as well. I suppose those are the most sort of obvious ways in which the, the lives of ordinary Parisians and ordinary French people are, are, are being changed or have been changed since Friday. And from the American viewpoint, I've read numerous stories of people, well, one family from here in the small town that I live in in Indiana was in Paris mm-hmm. during the attacks and and several other uh stories of well-known people that were were there. Um how how do you see this affecting tourism and And, you know, Paris is one of the most popular places in the entire world. I was going to say, I mean, Paris, the city of Paris, the city of lights, it has so many names, really, because it is such a a well-known attraction. And it is pulling in millions and millions and millions of people every year. Apparently, over the weekend, in the immediate aftermath of... um, of the attacks, we did see a little bit of a dip in hotel reservations, or or people chose to to cancel their reservations uh, if they were heading to Paris. I mean, from an American perspective, we've also seen uh, American Airlines, I believe, and, and also Delta Airlines actually canceling flights that were supposed to uh, to leave from the United States to to Paris. So uh, I'm sure we have seen a, an impact, a short-term impact. The question is what is going to happen in the longer term. Obviously, people will remember that there was another attack or another string of attacks uh, back in January. So with that in fresh memory and these new attacks, perhaps people will choose to stay away. Um, At the same time, well, you you need to say that Paris is a big city. Um, You don't feel threatened 
when you walk around in the streets of the French capital on a, on a daily basis. I don't. I, I'm guessing that most of my most of my fellow citizens don't either. Although, of course, it is always in the back of your mind. Uh, but I think we have to put it into perspective a little bit. These were obviously horrific attacks, and uh, we are still struggling to take it all in. But at the same time, there is this sense that we mustn't let daily life be impacted by it and that we mustn't give in, so to speak, to, to the terrorists, essentially. Exactly. And I'm glad to hear you say that. Um, your president has seemed to uh, come across as very um, a very strong person during this ordeal. Uh, is Am I accurate in... Uh, my assessment from afar? Uh, yeah, I, I would say that you are. Uh, he, he's he's done all right, François Hollande, or he has done well even, I, I would say, in the past few days. I'm guessing from the viewpoint of ordinary French people, he came out only hours after the attack. He declared a state of emergency. He actually went to the site of uh, the concert hall, the Bataclan, in the 11th arrondissement here in Paris, to basically see for himself uh, the damage that had been done. Uh, he has been speaking on numerous occasions since. On Monday, he was speaking in front of a special congress uh, of the French Parliament, basically a congress that gathered both chambers of the French Parliament, the, the lower house as well as the Senate. And he, he came across as being quite strong. He came across with uh, real propositions, so to speak, or real proposals, I should say, for actions from from here on in. So he has had a few uh, strong days, uh, that being said. Uh, again, um, cracks are starting to show a little bit in the political unity of France. François Hollande has spoken ever since this happened that we need to stay unified, we need to show a united front, uh, us politicians, alongside the French people. At the same time, we are starting to see a little bit of scepticism, for instance, when it comes to his wish or his ambition to prolong their state of emergency uh, by another three months. Some from the left wing of the French, uh, of the French, of French political life essentially don't feel completely comfortable with prolonging a state of emergency for, for, for three months. They simply think that that may be uh, too much, that that is a bridge too far, essentially. Mm -hmm. Now, Going forward, um, I'm thinking. Well, I'm thinking backward to when mm -hmm. September 11th happened uh, here in America, and going forward, um, it, sometimes from a, a perspective here, it's almost like people forget that September 11th even happened, other than on the anniversary and uh, that we, we kind of let our guard down. Did it, did it feel like maybe that happened between their terrorist attacks in, in January and, and these, or how does that seem to be playing out? Um, it's difficult to say whether or not we, we let our guard down. I'm, I'm not able to, at this stage, say whether or not intelligence services, for instance, perhaps felt a little bit more comfortable or have, have felt more comfortable in recent months and perhaps they dropped the ball on this one. Uh, it, it, I think it's too early to say and analyze that. Um, I can say that to a certain extent, French people and Parisians maybe did put uh, January's events uh, out of their head. Um, I mean, my reaction uh, w w when the news broke was that I had, it was a feeling of disbelief, uh, as in it, this can't be happening again after January's attacks. And then on top of it, it, it was even worse than back in January. Uh, so perhaps perhaps we did put our guard down or let our, let our guard down a, a little bit because we were thinking that lightning won't strike twice, at least not within the same mm -hmm. year. Um, but at the same time, Paris is a big city. Uh, there are rumors every now and then uh, of foiled plots every now and then you see more security mm -hmm. in the metro and you're thinking to yourself hmm do, do, do authorities m know more than they they let on maybe they they had news of a potential security uh, not threat but 
essentially security worry. Um, so to a certain extent, it is always in the back of our heads, I think, that something could happen. Uh, I mean, if I see an abandoned bag in, in the metro or if I see an abandoned bag on a bus, I will certainly worry. I, w I will look twice. I will sort of look around uh, to see if some somebody seems to be in charge of that bag or seems to seems to own that bag. Um, so I, I suppose yes and no in the in the sense yes we have let our guard down a little bit since January because we thought that it couldn't happen again so soon, but at the same time it's always at the back of our heads. Well. Something that we share is that ISIS has openly proclaimed that uh, they are coming after both of our countries. And um, do people – I know your president said we're at war, but do mm -hmm. people – does it seem like uh, you know, ISIS isn't a country? You know, they're, they're all over the place. And so does it feel like you're really at war? Or, you know, I'm not even sure how to even get the, the question out because, you know, if, if you go to war against a country, you know, you can have parameters of what things are. When you go to war against somebody like ISIS and they're everywhere and you don't know where they are and they show up in, in your capital city and massacre dozens of people, is that uh, – are you at war? Um, it's difficult to say because it's been so intense since Friday, but to a certain extent, I suppose, I suppose France is at war with, um, IS or the Islamic state group. But at the same time, I mean, we don't see bombs go off, um, in Paris on a daily basis as, as we may see in Damascus. Uh, or, or in other Syrian cities. So from that perspective, war seems to be still quite far away. Um, but then obviously, I mean, France and Paris has been made a target uh, by, uh, by the Islamic State group. So um, I, su I suppose we are at war, but it, it, it is just still kind of sinking in. I right. suppose that, it, I don't know if that makes any sense, but it, 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 it things have changed and things have changed rapidly just in the past three or four days. And even though France and 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 the French Air Force has been participating in the in the uh, bombings on Islamic State targets for I think around about fourteen months now, or at least France stepped up its actions around about fourteen months ago. I suppose it still has seemed quite a far. It's seemed quite far away, and uh, France's uh, participation in the aerial raids on Islamic State has been sort of haphazard. It hasn't been regular, whereas now uh, I think we can expect, and the president has said as much, that we uh, or that French airstrikes w will become more frequent and will be stepped up. So uh, you, your answer is kind of like my question. It's like we're at war, but it's hard to define what the battlefield is. Um, uh, I, 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 yes, I think you're right. I mean, it, it, it is just, war still seems quite far away. I mean, we're not in a World War II-like situation here. Uh, we don't see bombs being dropped on us uh, on a daily basis or on an hourly basis. So, uh, yeah, as I say, war still seems quite far away, but to a certain extent, it, it, it is upon us. Well, I, I certainly appreciate you taking uh, time out of your day. Um, I always finish my interviews with a, a short word of prayer, and so I hope that it that it's okay with you. And then sure. after I pray, I have one last question for you, and um, we'll let you get back to what it is that you've got going on this evening there at the news station. Father in heaven, I thank you for this opportunity that you give me to speak with Marcus, and I just ask your blessings upon him, the work that he does, his fellow citizens, and those that live there in Paris especially. I pray for those who are, are wounded and need to recover, and I pray for those who lost loved ones and are mourning. Father, help us 
to be safe from this Islamic State. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Marcus, for allowing me to, to pray with you. Thank you. Um, um, the um, the injuries that took place, uh, is there an update on uh, how many are, are critical? And, and, you know, is there expected to be m- more loss of life from the attack? Uh, at the moment, the the, the 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 official death toll stands at 129, uh, and unfortunately, yes, there is there is a real risk of that uh, heading higher due to the fact that I think more around about two dozen people are still in a critical condition. They're still being treated for for what doctors say are warlike injuries after having been after essentially having been shot by by machine gun fire. So unfortunately, I think that the, there is a risk that the, uh, the the death toll could head higher. Although we, we certainly hope that that it won't. Right. Well, again, Marcus, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. As you said, you've been busy nonstop since Friday, and uh, thank you for introducing yourself to our listeners. And uh, you'll stay in our prayers. Thank you very much, Ed. It's been a pleasure. All right. God bless. All right. Well, that was Marcus. Marcus is from France 24. Marcus Carlson, uh, an English-speaking television station live from Paris, France. Uh, You can listen to that television station uh, in a couple of different ways. You can go to – let's see if I can find the links. I I got so many. uh, www. France24.com. Uh, they live stream on the site and on YouTube. Uh, you can find them on Facebook and just wherever uh, you normally find live streaming events. Uh, Got to tell you that it's just amazing that this man took his time to to be with our our show because he was he had just finished a live broadcast when he called and we were we meaning Trevor, Amy and myself were watching uh the uh live stream on the YouTube channel and just shortly after he got off of the interview with with our show here he was back on on the air live and it just boggles my mind that the man was willing to take his time to uh, to be with us in the midst of his evening uh his evening work uh he um well let's see it was i think 8 something in the evening when we were talking his time uh, so it's a it's a 24 news station, something like Fox or CNN or something to that nature. And uh, I, again, I'm just amazed that Marcus would take his time. Uh, hopefully, we can hook up with him uh, other times uh, when if it's necessary. And um, as always, I feel like I've made a new friend when I get done interviewing somebody. Uh, don't forget, at the top of the hour, we are going to interview uh, Jeff Kinley. He has a new book out, uh, and he is pretty much an expert on biblical prophecy, end times, and we're going to tie together some of the things that are going on in Paris with 
uh, his book and, and have a nice discussion there right at the top of the hour. Uh, but in between times, I've got plenty of content on these topics. Uh, these topics being Paris, ISIS, and the evil of Islam. And if you are listening to this and want to see what I look like, uh, I'm on live on Periscope right now. And just go to Periscope at Boston.com, I think, and you'll find this. And uh, right now you'll get a, a profile look at me because I'm paying attention to my computer screen, uh, my switchboard, because obviously the uh, – the podcast is my main concern, but then every once in a while I'll turn around and I'll wave to my, my friends over there on Periscope and, and, uh, make sure they know that I, I haven't forgotten all about them. Uh, I, I hardly know what order to take these in because they're all very concerning to me. Uh, should be very concerning to you. Uh, I'm going to read some things, give you lots of my opinion, and we're going to be uh, way more opinion tonight than uh, maybe what's normal. Uh, in his address, uh, President Obama mentioned that uh, he believes ISIS has been contained. Uh, in this interview, or not interview, but this article, uh, Senator Dianne Feinstein, and you would have to think that uh, of the conservatives that this would not be something that w we would be using uh, to talk about what we uh, feel about this. But she expressed her strong concern over ISIS, saying it's not contained on MSNBC's Andrea Mitchell reports. I've, she says, I have never been more concerned. I read the intelligence faithfully. Of course, she is with the administration on calling them ISIL. ISIL is not contained. ISIL is expanding. They've just put out a video saying it is their intent to attack this country. And we'll get to that in just a little bit. And I think we have to be prepared. I think, hopefully, France will go for a Chapter 5, which will bring NATO into it. Hopefully, we will work with our allies to put together the kind of coalitions and attack plans in more than one place at a given time. There's only one way we're going to diminish them, and that is by taking them out because they are growing. They are in more than a dozen countries right now. I'm, I'm, I don't see none of the intelligence that she gets a chance to see, and I'm going to just flat out say that ISIS is in way more than a dozen countries. Uh, just saying. Don't know, but let's say that uh, that's just a quite an understatement. Hello there over on Periscope. We don't want to look, you to forget me to forget that you're over there um, talking. <laughs> it always works out this way. I'm in the middle of the periscope, and so if something happens on my phone, like it rings, it messes things up. So periscope is done for the night. I said I would keep it on for part of the show. Well, part of the show is over. And <laughs> oh, let's get back to Senator Feinstein. They're sophisticated. They have apps to communicate on that cannot be pierced even with a court order. So they have the, a kind of secret way of being able to conduct operations and operational planning. We should take this very, very seriously. Diane Feinstein. Now, sometimes on um, national security issues, she's a little better than she is on other things, but uh, – as far as this situation goes, uh, she um, she 
she's right on the money. ISIS is, as I mentioned in the interview with Marcus, they're everywhere. Uh, and when I say everywhere, I'm talking about probably somewhere within a hundred miles of where you are or less. Really, I'm serious. How do I know that? I don't. And, you know, if you happen to be listening and you live in, in Montana and it's hundreds of miles between you and the next city, then maybe uh, I'm not right. But um, I'm just telling you right now that they are here in America. There's no doubt about it. Um and um, wow, when the liberals are saying that we're not, we don't have ISIS contained, they're pretty much calling the president out and calling him a liar because that's what he, he said. And I wanted to include, and we've already prayed once, uh, wanted to include scripture reading. I want to read to you a, a passage from the book of Revelation. Um, and I'm waiting for my window to load. Here we go. We're in the book of Revelation, chapter 16, starting at verse 14. It says, they are demonic spirits that perform signs, and they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for the battle on the great day of God Almighty. Look, I come like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and remains clothed so as not to go naked and be shamefully exposed. Then they gathered the kings together to the place that in the Hebrew is called Armageddon. Did you hear what, he, what John wrote there? Demonic spirits that perform signs. And they're gathering together for the battle on that great day of God Almighty. Next hour, after we interview Jeff Kinley, I'll be reading to you some of the things that he had to say about uh, a couple of chapters in the book of Ezekiel. And folks, we are in a time of, well, we're in a time of war. We're in a time of demon possession. We are in a time of of evil. And I'm just going to say it, and I know that there were people and maybe people listening right now that don't believe me, but Islam is evil. I know that you can go find people that profess to be Muslim and not evil, but it's an evil religion. We're taught that there is only one way to heaven, and that's that's through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And there is nothing in there that says that Islam is okay. There's nothing in Christianity that says convert or we cut your head off. That's what that's what well, they want to call. Radical Islam does. I seen a picture. Actually, Amy sent it to me a couple of days ago. It's a picture of a bowl of M and M's, all different colored M and M's, and it said that. So all Muslims are not barbaric, or not evil, whatever word you want to put in there that only 10% of them are. And then it said, it's like having a bowl of M&Ms and saying only 10% of them are poisoned. Are you going to grab you a big handful and chow down? I think not because 10% is enough to kill you. And that's what they're doing Insane and uh, and 
making threats to continue. They are um, – they're just evil. And, well, let's uh, just call a spade a spade, and that's what it is. They're evil. Uh Let's think about Gitmo for a second. Full of Islamic terrorists. Well, it's not full anymore. Down to, I think, 107. But just a day or two after the attacks in Paris took place, the um, Obama administration decided that that was the best time to release five Yemeni detainees from Guantanamo Bay to the United Arab Emirates. Uh, story that's up on AlanWest.com. You've heard it probably. It's all over the news. Uh, I just wanted to use Alan West because I like him so much, like the way he says things. It is clearly evident that President Barack Obama and his administration cared little about reality but will push ahead with their ideological agenda. Here we are just days after a horrific Islamic terror attack in Paris, and what is the Obama administration's response? They release five detainees from Guantanamo Bay to the United Arab Emirates. I suppose it's fair enough. Seems that the bad guys lost aid in Paris, so it's proper that we refill their ranks, Colonel West says. After all, we did send back the Taliban's senior military staff for a deserter. Oops, I mean a fellow who served with honor and distinction. Uh, Colonel West says, as reported by U.S. News and World Report, five men held by the U.S. at its base in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, have been released and sent to the United Arab Emirates. Uh, I, I know that I thought originally, and I think maybe the early reports that were out, uh, was that they were released to Kazakhstan. And apparently that is erroneous. Let's see. If I make a mistake, I own up to it. Uh, the Pentagon says the five Yemeni men were accepted for resettlement in the Persian Gulf nation after U.S. authorities determined they no longer posed a threat. Well, they weren't a threat at Guantanamo Bay, that's for sure. But they had been there for over 13 years. Uh, the Defense Department said in a statement Sunday that their release brings the Gitmo prisoner population to 107. Each of the five released over the weekend had been held for more than 13 years. They were not charged but were detained as in enemy combatants. Their release was delayed because the U.S. won't send um, they won't send Gitmo prisoners to Yemen because of instability there and must find other countries to accept them. This these are the first prisoners accepted by United Arab Emirates for resettlement. Boy, there's lots of resettlement going on. We got refugees coming in. We're going to talk about that later on. Um, we got Gitmo people going. And, and here's the thing. It's a proven fact. It's not just Ed's opinion. It's not just conservative opinion. It's a proven fact that many of the people that were released from Gitmo went back and are now back in the terrorism. Uh, <laughs> uh, Mary in the chat room says it doesn't take too many to do damage. There were only 14 in the F France attack. So we are releasing five people that were bad enough that we held them for 13 years. And it's almost like and I, and I hate to say this, but I, I think I said it in my daily video blog, or not my daily video blog because I miss it occasionally, but in my video blog a couple days ago uh, on the Ed Boston YouTube channel, that it's Obama just give us the big F you. You know, flew that middle finger up at the whole world and, and said, uh, you know, ISIS is going to – well, he wouldn't say ISIS, but – ISIL is what he would say. ISIS is uh, contained, and so they may have attacked Paris, but screw you. 
we're releasing people. And guess what? Who knows? They may come back and be part of another terrorist attack later on. Ah, well, as we finish up talking about Gitmo, I got a, a clip that I'm very, rather fond of that I did myself, and uh, listen to this. Hey, this is Ed from Ed Boston Ministries. Wanted to let everyone know that I'm taking bookings for speaking engagements. Sunday church services, extended numbers of services or revival, individual groups, or really just about any event you would like to invite me to. Just email me at bookings at edboston.com. Looking forward to hearing from you. God bless and go out and do the right thing. All right. Well, that's it. That's right. I'm accepting bookings for uh, speaking engagements, uh, church services, whatever you would like to invite me to. Um, What about me doing my own ad like that? I was given some instruction, given some material, and I put that all together myself. So for those of you that have been around a long time, Um, thinking, wow, he's getting better. I guess you can teach an old dog new tricks. Um, a couple more things before we get to, um, um, the interview with Jeff Kinley. We've talked about, uh, there are Democrats, uh, who are basically calling uh, the president a liar. Uh, We talked about the president flying the big F you at the world by releasing uh, five Gitmo detainees. Uh, What about the refugees that are coming to the United States from Syria? Um. What about that? You think there is any possibility that there could be a terrorist uh, amongst them? Is it possible? Uh, (laughs) Mary says, it's not refugees, it's an invasion. And uh, I say, well, that's about as good a way as you can put it as, as possible. Because uh, they are um, supposedly 10,000 that we've agreed to accept. Uh, Now, over half of the governors in America has said, don't send them to my state. Uh, I read a, a story yesterday that was bothersome that said that governors didn't have that power based on a couple of Supreme Court decisions, that it's the executive branch of the federal government that controls um, um, that controls immigration policy. And so uh, I don't know that I agree with that. Uh, I think the the 26 plus governors that have said that, uh, I have a feeling they believe that they can control that. But what I I am happy to have seen is that um, there are moves within uh, Congress to block the funding. You know, the president talks about doing things by executive order, and actually he doesn't talk as much about it as his press secretary does. And uh, But you got to have money to be able to do that. And Congress still does control the purse strings. They might not control too terribly much, but 
um, you know, it's time, folks, listen to this, time that we take this threat seriously. Part of the new, I mean, part of the second hour of this show is going to be there are new targets that ISIS is openly saying that they will attack. And I'll give you a preview of that. Paris is the capital of France. What is the capital of the United States? Hmm. Anyway, it is time that we take them seriously. They tell us in advance that they're going to do something, and guess what? Playing. They do it. They're serious. And earlier I said if you don't think they're near you, then you you need to – Look around a little bit. This is an older article. This comes back from March of 2015, and um, but it, the title of it is "Why Was ISIS Terror Operative Nihad Rozik Arrested in Plainfield, Indiana?" Plainfield, Indiana. Let's see, Columbus, Indiana, Indianapolis, Plainfield's just on the other side. That's about uh, oh, I'm sure Amy, when she walks through the door, could tell me how far it is to Plainfield because she used to work there. I'd say somewhere around 60 miles, and she's nodding her head and saying I'm about right. Did I say earlier that they're probably within a hundred miles of where you're living? They're within a hundred miles of where I'm living. Uh, six individuals of Bosnian origin from St. Louis, Rock. Illinois and Utica, New York, were indicted last month on charges of supplying money and equipment to the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. And yet late last week, it was revealed that one of those terror suspects, Nihad Rozik, was also one of two suspects additionally charged with conspiring to kill and many others in a foreign country and had attempted to board a plane back in July of 2014 to fly to Syria to join ISIS, and he had actually been apprehended in the small town of Plainfield, Indiana, right outside of Indianapolis. This was in March of this year. They are in your neighborhood, people. Whether you want to believe that or don't want to believe that, they are in your neighborhood. And when I say neighborhood, I don't necessarily mean next door, but guess what? They might even be right next door. That guy that was arrested in Plainfield, Indiana, was right next door to somebody that lived in a small town. You know, people would say, well, that's just a suburb of Indianapolis. Well, okay, it's close to Indianapolis, and Indianapolis is not a small town. But he was living in the – well, he was – I ain't going to say he was living because I don't know where he was living. He was arrested in a small town in Indiana. They are here, folks, and if you don't get on with it – um. You, you're going to be sorry. There was 129 families, of, and they weren't all from from France. So one American was in it, but the 129 families, due to what happened in Paris, France, that are now mourning the loss of loved ones because ISIS does what they say they're going to do. And guess what? They're not all these refugees that are coming in from from Syria and, and all the other places. A lot of them are homegrown right here in America. We've got two congressmen that are Muslim. How can that happen? One of them is representing Indianapolis, Indiana. Again, let's see. Oh, 45 miles from Columbus, Indiana. Now, he would tell you that he is not a jihadi if you were to ask him that. He probably wouldn't even – he'd probably choke over that term. <laughs> but if you have paid attention to him, you will know that he has attended conferences and been places where there are known terrorist sympathizers. That's a fact. Don't believe me? Look it up for yourself. 
Search Andre Carson. Search Andre Carson Muslim. Search Andre Carson Muslim terrorist sympathizer and see what you find. Oh, man, I better watch out. There might be a black helicopter over top. Can you see black helicopters at night? Uh, no, probably not. They're stealth. Well, it's great to have my wife in here with me. She had a long day working two different jobs. And uh, so, uh, again, it's great to have her with me. Um, and she actually provided some of the material that we're, we were using tonight. Uh, that last story in particular was one that she had had sent to me uh, a, a little while ago, a couple days ago. Um, and I had read it back in March when it happened. And, you know, that's the thing about the jihadis. They want us to be so complacent that we don't prepare ourselves. That was my question to Marcus um, in that they just had a major terrorist attack in January. They had another one thwarted just a few months ago by three American servicemen. And and still, they are able to infiltrate enough to do what they did this last week. They are good at what they do. Don't, don't underestimate the enemy. But you better get to know the enemy and know what they stand for. Know who you are fighting. And... You heard today. I mean, Marcus was telling that the chancellor of Germany was supposed to be at that football match. Get that football match. It was soccer. She was supposed to be there and was basically showing that we're going to live our lives in a way that we're not going to show that we're afraid. And something, something was bad enough that they had to cancel or at least postpone that soccer match. Uh, you know, again, go to uh, France24.com and you can see uh, a, um, a lot of information. That's where Marcus works. And if you're watching... Uh, on your computer, you can see pictures scrolling through, and you know, there's a picture of Marcus that's in there. Um, a story that is, is up today there. There's growing unease among French police over a potential intelligence lapse after it emerged from a, that a note from a Paris police, from the Paris police, about a group of six people preparing a major attack was not passed on to the country's internal intelligence agency. See, they are depending on us being lax. It w if this was the case, if this, if this story is accurate, then it was actually even police that were being lax. And when the police are lax, my wife just said, I don't know if you can hear, that's dangerous. And so as we get ready to wrap up, Hour one of the Ed Boston podcast, and, and the show's going to fly by tonight. It seemed like I just started. Uh, if you if you just joined us and you missed the interview that I did with Marcus Carlson, who is a uh, TV anchor with France Twenty Four, he called. He actually called here live from Paris today. You need to re-listen to the first hour when you get a chance hopefully after you listen to the second hour live here, mm -hmm. but uh, we are going to get into hour two right now. And we actually have another interview with a gentleman by the name of Jeff Kinley. Uh, thought that um, the time with Jeff went very well. And I think you're going to enjoy this interview. So welcome to the Ed Boston podcast. If you're just joining us, uh, this is hour two, 
and we're just going to jump right in because we are rolling on something right now. <laughs> I, you know, Amy, I, I was trying to think of a good quip to go in there, and work, and sometimes it just doesn't work. It just doesn't roll off your tongue like you would hope it would. So we're rolling somehow, uh, and hopefully. Um, I well, I may have to talk here for a minute because I think. All right, welcome to this segment of the Ed Boston Podcast, and we are privileged to have with us Jeff Kinley, uh, author of a new book called Wake the Bride. Welcome to the show, Jeff. Thanks, Ed. Great to be with you today. Well, you just told me off the air that um, you're being flooded out down there in Arkansas. Uh, any, anything else good going on down there? <laughs> well, it's a much needed rain, I'll say that, but uh, yeah, lots lots of great things. Things are happening with uh, uh, with my new book, Wake the Bride, and God is really increasing its uh, message and outreach and influence, and so we're just gearing up to continue to help people have a, a message of hope and, and, uh, and truth in these really perilous times in which we live. Well, and you know, I started off with a little lightheartedness, but our, our topic today is one that uh, certainly isn't humorous at all. We're going to talk a little bit about what happened in Paris, uh, then we're going to kind of tie that into to your book, uh, the the subtitle being Revelation, Rapture, Romance, Sleepy Time is Over. Um, how does what happened in Paris tie into the end times, in, in your opinion? Well, you know, the, these recent terrorist attacks in Paris, Ed, I think have a lot of people wondering right now uh, what this means for the world, uh, what it means for America. But I think it has Christians asking themselves, you know, could this have any sort of connection to biblical prophecy and the end times? And so, you know, as you search the scripture, uh, you won't find a specific chapter and verse that, that specifically identifies radical Islam by name. But I think there are three important things that are worth noting just kind of as we back up and sort of get the panorama or the big picture of what's going on here. Uh, one is the fact that I think what we're seeing right now is really reference to uh, what I wrote about in my previous book, as it was in the days of Noah, where I talked about how in the end times uh, we will experience an increasing hostility, hatred, and violence towards humanity, uh, but with Jews and Christians especially targeted. And we know that during the tribulation period in the book of Revelation that persecution, violence, and murder will really be at a fever pitch uh, towards those who come to faith in Jesus Christ. And so I think that what we're seeing right now is perhaps a foreshadowing of that future time where this thing's going to be ramped up to a whole new level, sort of birth pangs before the, the birth event. Uh, second thing is, from just a, uh, an American perspective, uh, last month, I know the FBI director, James Comey, said that they are currently investigating at least 900 different jihadist and ISIS-related activities going on on American soil right now. And that includes every single one of the 50 states, meaning that ISIS has now a network of supporters and sympathizers in every state of the, of the union. And so I think for us as Americans, it really is a time to be alert, uh, to be vigilant, and to be on, on our guard. Uh, but thirdly, I think that, you know, as you look at biblical prophecy, you know, Ezekiel 38 and 39 speak of what is popularly known as the War of, of Gog and Magog, where basically a coalition of nations, including Russia with, with current Muslim nations, will attempt to erase Israel off the map uh, during uh, the tribulation period. And I don't think that they're going to succeed in that. But I do believe that the rise, the current rise of radical Islam in recent history can only point towards a time when the, really the whole Islamic world will turn on Israel. And so with that, you have also, Ed, I think the, the kind of the interesting, intriguing part for me is that uh, Muslim extremists have now resurrected this barbaric ancient practice of beheading. You know, you read in the Bible in Revelation 24 that those who come to faith in Christ during the tribulation, that their chosen method of being executed will be beheading. And, you know, for years you read about that and you think, gosh, how's that, how's that going to happen? Are they going to bring back the guillotine? Or, you know, I don't think anybody really realized 
the resurgence of this barbaric, brutal method of execution, uh, enjoying really a resurrection in the end times. And yet that's exactly what these radical Islamists have done. They brought back beheading. And so uh, these Christian martyrs in the tribulation period uh, will have their heads uh, you know, chopped off by an axe. And so having been laid dormant for 2,000 years, this, this beheading thing is uh, seeing a resurgence in the last day. So those are some of the specific things that I see as it relates to what's happening now. It's sort of like we're getting the previews of what's going to be ramping up as we get to Revelation. But I think, too, one more thing. Um, I think just in the broader picture uh, in terms of hope and for Christians is that this ancient hatred that we're seeing uh, right now, this evil that's gaining traction right now in our days, is really a bigger picture of Satan's overall hatred of God, his hatred of humanity, uh, his hatred of Israel, and of course, followers of Christ. And so as Satan turns up the heat on Christians worldwide, as Christ predicted in John 15, he says, if they hate you, they'll hate me, they'll hate you. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. Um, I think this is something that we have to deal with as Christians, that we're only going to experience increased hostility uh, as the time approaches for Christ's return. You mentioned that uh, as Americans that, you know, and, and American Christians, uh, we we ask ourselves, uh, is this biblical end times type of things? But do you see uh, America in general really um, grasping that the threat is what it is? It seems to me that we, we seem a little bit lackadaisical on recognizing the enemy. Yeah, and, and isn't that the pattern of history, Ed, is that countries that are uh, that are invaded, that are conquered, uh, countries that are uh, toppled from without, are usually countries that are complacent, uh, con- countries that are smug, people that think it can't happen here. We are more like 1939 Germany right now than at any point since that day. And so I do think that we as Americans, and, and particularly even as Christians, that we're asleep right now, that we are not taking these these threats seriously when these uh, radical Islamist uh, clerics uh, and imams have said, hey, we're coming to your cities. And in fact, our FBI says they're already here. So I think it's um, it's a time for Christians to really wake up, open their eyes. And I think that here's the good thing about it, though. You think, well, gosh, what can possibly be good about that? But I think the coming attacks, and I believe there will be attacks on American soil. Um, and if you think about it from a logical standpoint, if you're a radical Muslim and most, even most Christians don't even understand how dedicated, how fervent, how committed these people are to their cause and to their uh, philosophy, we're opening the gate for them to be here, and we have opened the gate. So they're going to fulfill uh, at least an attempt to, to bring that, uh, that Muslim dominance here in America. So when those attacks happen, it's going to change us. But I think what it's going to do for the church is going to wake us up to the fact that evil exists. And evil is not just a principle that's just kind of floating around out there. It exists inside the human heart. And these people, I believe, are, are demonized, uh, that are doing these brutal acts on, on citizens uh, worldwide. But I think it's going to wake the church up. I think it's going to purify our passion for Christ and for evangelism to see to tell people, you know, now is the time for you to give your heart to Jesus Christ. But the great news about that is, not only will I believe that it will purify the bride, but I think our sovereign God has still got history under under control. And I think all these things that Satan is inspiring right now through radical Islam, I believe our sovereign God will turn those things into good for us eventually. Let's at, let's look just real briefly about the political issues that go with this topic and and there are some politicians that won't even acknowledge the words radical islam Mm -hmm. comment on that if you will yeah well once again you know we live in an uh, in an era of uh, political correctness uh, in a time where um, i really think that that there is a pervasive spirit in the world that we're still not uh, we're, we're two generations away from hitler you know, we've not had a, an evil entity really to to personify the fact that that we recognize that, that there's depravity on planet Earth. 
And so I think a lot of times because we don't want to offend people that we're just afraid to say these people are morally depraved. They are evil entities, and they must be stopped. And so I hear a lot of Christians saying things like, well, you know, we need to pray for, pray for them, and we need to, you know, try to reach them, and we need to open our doors kind of thing. But, you know, in reality, all that sort of sentimentality really kind of washes out when one of those guys blows up, you know, a bunch of people inside a mall somewhere. I mean, until it comes home to where we are, I think people are going to really just kind of not think that it could happen or that it's going to be real. So I think people play that politically correct game. And and it's not to say those people cannot be saved. And, you know, God saved the Apostle Paul. Sure, he can do anything. But, you know, these people are so ingrained and brainwashed and depraved, I believe that the vast majority of them have been given over to Satan, and Satan is using them for his evil purposes. So it's going to take something radical for us to see uh, just how depraved and evil these people really are. Which, to me, makes me scratch my head and and think September the 11th, 2001. And you, you, you... You've made that reference, you know, two or three times, and I, I fully agree with you. But do, have we totally forgotten what hap- happened that day? And yeah, you know, we, we really there. have it. Yeah, I mean, we have very, very short memories uh, as as citizens today. Our attention spans, you know, don't last any longer than a tweet, a text, or a selfie. So I mean, we're a country of people who really can't dwell on history very well. And, you know, it's it's worth revisiting what we felt on, on 9-11, you know, as we saw those towers fell and as our whole country shut down. Look, you know, th- these guys with just a few planes, I mean, they, they put our country into a grinding halt. They, they put fear and panic and terror into the citizens of America. And those are lessons that I, I believe that we've forgotten in our country. And so it really from the top of our leadership down, we're just kind of playing this game to where we're not taking these people seriously, and they are very serious about their cause. We need to be just as serious as Americans and as believers uh, about the gospel and about purifying the bride of Christ. Right. Now, Jeff, you're a graduate, a graduate, and a graduate. Boy, that's good English. <laughs> <laughs> a graduate of uh, Dallas Theological Seminary, and, and this new book that you've written, Wake the Bride. Uh, Tell us what, what uh, inspired you and just share a little bit about the book with us. Yeah. Well, uh, I was following up from uh, my book as it was in the days of Noah, which really kind of you know, got our minds to look at the world around us, see where we are in prophecy, the things that Jesus said were going to be indicative of the last day's generation. I believe we're seeing right now. And following up from that, I thought, you know, now it's time for the church to look at herself. It's not so much looking at the world, but now when you look at the church. And so that's really at what the whole book of Revelation uh, was written for. And just really, if you think about it, it was written in the late 90s uh, in the first century. And just two generations past the church being birthed, the crucifixion, resurrection, ascension of Christ, the church had just lost her identity. I mean, she was no longer even <clears throat> resembling herself. And so... She had fallen asleep. She had entertained false doctrines. She had become self-absorbed. There was no passion about Christ, no fervency in her faith. And she wasn't eagerly expecting the return of Jesus like she used to. So Christ inspired and gave John this vision of the book of Revelation to wake the bride, to tell her about the things that were going to happen on planet Earth so that she wouldn't put down her roots too deep here in this world, and to give her hope for the future and for the glorious triumph of Jesus' second coming. And so the book was written to help Christians have that fervency in their faith and their passion and their love for Christ. And I don't know of a better time in human history that we need that than right now. And so that's why I wrote this book, to walk them through Revelation and to wake the bride to fall in love with Christ again. Amen to that, brother. Um, And uh, where can we find this book? Where are we able to purchase it from? Yeah, you can get Wake the Bride uh, anywhere books are sold, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Lifeway, uh, Books a Million, Mardell's, wherever you uh, normally buy books, you can get it. And uh, in fact, tonight uh, I'm, I'm doing a, a broadcast, uh, a national broadcast on uh, uh, webcast on Google, and I'm um, going to be talking about Wake the Bride as well. So, And your social media sites and different things like that, how can we find yeah. out more about Jeff Kinley? 
Absolutely. JeffKinley.com. You can go there and you can find out my Twitter handle and my Facebook page. And uh, that I keep all my friends and fans updated on things on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all that kind of thing. So you can uh, contact me there. All right. Well, let's have a word of prayer before we let you go yeah. today. Father, I just come to you now thanking you for this time we've had to discuss such an important issue and that being your word, your word and your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for Jeff and, and his abilities and the abilities that he's using to share the gospel message with those of us who, who know it, but those who don't know it as well. Father, I pray that you would be with our country and be with citizens around the world as we do face this evil. And we just ask, Father, that you would help us to wake up and recognize what the face of evil is and that, that Satan uses men and women here today. And as our guest said, possess them with demons. And, Father, we... We like to think the best of things, but your word shows us that there will be evil in this world throughout. And so, Father, I ask your protection. I ask for wisdom upon our leaders. And, Father, I thank you for men and women who are willing to stand up and tell the truth. And it's obvious from just listening to Jeff this short period of time that that's what he does. Bless his life. Bless his, bless his family. Bless his work. Help the fruit to bear and to bear abundantly. And we pray this all in the holy and precious name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Ed. Well, what's next for Jeff Kinley after this book? Well, I'm about to start a, a new book co-authoring with a man by the name of Dr. Mark Hitchcock, whom I believe to be the premier prophecy expert in the country today. And uh, we're starting a book uh, that relates to the end times as well about the coming apostasy that Paul predicted uh, and how do we as a church maintain our doctrinal purity during a time when people seem to be accepting just about every every kind of idea uh, out there. So uh, so getting ready to start that up and uh, continuing just to travel to churches and, and uh, groups and stuff to bring the message of Wake the Bride. All right, Jeff. Well, you have a great day down there, and uh, I hope you don't um, get too much rain. <laughs> that sounds great, Ed. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks for being with us. Okay. Bye-bye. All right, folks. That was Jeff Kinley. He is the author of the new book, Wake the Bride, Revelation, Rapture, Romance, Sleepy Time is Over. We'll be back with more of the Ed Boston Podcast right after this. And so we're back, and I thought the time we spent with Jeff was very well done by him, uh, very profitable for all of us to listen to. And uh, again, I've made a new friend uh, through uh, an interview. Uh, I got friends all over the place that I've never met in person, but uh, we've interviewed here on the Ed Boston Podcast. Lots of interesting things, and we talked about this uh, a few weeks ago about the FBI director saying that there were over 900 jihadists uh, that they were currently investigating, 900, let me say that one more time, 900, that's ones that are known, 900 Nine hundred is how many? I'm trying to make that point clear to you. Nine hundred, and get this: by nine hundred, by oh, let's say eight or nine. You know, the number that was in France. Huh? How many terrorist attack could they pull off? Then you factor in the ones that aren't known yet. How many terrorist attacks could they pull off? Huh. 
That's not old intel. That's recent. From not anybody that is, you know, far right black helicopter swinging Republicans. That came from the FBI director of the Obama administration. I'm surprised he still has a job, by the way. Uh, again, want to thank Jeff Kinley for his time he spent with us. And uh, again, don't forget his book, uh, Wake Up the Bride. See, I said that wrong. Wake the Bride, not Wake Up the Bride. Wake the Bride. And uh, he, he said you can get anywhere you normally buy books, uh, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and uh I'll make a joke and say Barnes and Nobles, and only a few of you will know what that means. Uh, Amy laughed, so she knew what it meant. <laughs> and uh, let's continue on. I still got a lot of topics that I want to get to here in this second half. Uh, but the first thing that I want to do is um, look at some scripture. He mentioned Ezekiel. And chapters 38 and or 37 and 38. Uh, you know, we we many times think of Revelation as being where Bible prophecy is, but it's actually throughout the Bible. End times prophecy is what I'm talking about here. Uh, of course, there's all kinds of prophecy in the Old Testament about the coming of Jesus that has already been fulfilled. But there's also a, a lot of end time prophecy. In the Old Testament, meaning hundreds of years before Jesus uh, showed up here on the earth. Um, in, thir in chapter 37, we're just going to look at a part of this. Uh, one nation under one king. This is chapter 37, starting at verse 15. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, take a stick of wood and write on it, belonging to Judah and the Israelites associated with him. Then take another stick of wood and write on it, belonging to Joseph, that is, to Ephraim, and all the Israelites associated with him. Join them together into one stick, so they will become one in your hand. When your people ask, won't you tell us what you mean by this, say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I'm going to take the stick of Joseph, which is in Ephraim's hand, and of the Israelite tribes associated with him, and join it to Judah's stick. I will make them into a single stick of wood, and they will become one in my hand. Hold before their eyes the sticks you have written on, and say to them, This is what the Sovereign Lord says. I will take the Israelites out of the nations where they have gone. I will gather them from all around and bring them back into their own land. I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel. There will be one king over all of them, and they will never again be two nations or be divided into two kingdoms. They will no longer defile themselves with their idols and vile images or with any of their offenses, for I will save them from all their sinful backsliding, and I will cleanse them. They will be my people, and I will be their God. My servant David will be king over them, and they will all have one shepherd. They will follow my laws and be careful to keep my decrees. They will live in the land I gave to my servant Jacob, the land where your ancestors lived. They and their children and their children's children will live there forever. And David, my servant, will be their prince forever. I will make a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant. I will establish them and increase their numbers. And I will put my sanctuary among them forever. My dwelling place will be with them. I will be their God and they will be my people. When the nations, then the nations will know that I, the Lord, make Israel holy. When my sanctuary is among them forever. And then moving into chapter 38. Ezekiel writes, and this is under the heading of the Lord's great victory over the nations. The Lord, or the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, set your face against Gog and the land of Magog. 
the chief prince of Meshech and Tabul, prophesy against him and say, This is what the sovereign Lord says. I am against you, Gog, chief prince of Meshech and Tobal. I will turn you around, put hooks in your jaws, and bring you out with your whole army, your horses, your horsemen fully armed, and the great horde with large and small shields, all of them brandishing their swords, Persia, Cush, and Put, will be with them, all with shields and helmets, also Gomer with all its troops, and Beth, Togarma, from the far north with all of its troops, the many nations with you. Get ready, be prepared, you and all of the hordes gathered around you, and take command of them. After many days, you will be called to arms. In future years, you will invade a land that has recovered from war, whose people were gathered from the many nations to the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. They had been brought out of the nations, and now all of them live in safety. You and all your troops and the many nations with you will go up, advancing like a storm, and you will be like a cloud covering the land. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. On that day, thoughts will come into your mind, and you will devise an evil scheme. You will say, I will invade a land of unwilling, uh, unwalled villages. I will attack a peaceful and unsuspecting people, all of them living without walls and without gates and bars. I will plunder and loot and turn my hand against the uh, resettled ruins of the people gathered from the nations, rich in livestock and goods, living at the center of the land. Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish and all her villages will say to you, Have you come to plunder? Have you gathered your hordes to loot, to carry off silver and gold, to take away livestock and goods, and to seize much plunder? Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to Gog, this is what the sovereign Lord says. In that day, when my people Israel are living in safety, will you not take notice of it? You will come from your place in the far north, you and many nations with you, all of them riding on horses, a great horde a mighty army. You will advance against my people, Israel, like a cloud that covers the land. In the days to come, Gog, I will, I will bring you against my land so that the nations may know me when I am proved holy through you before their eyes. This is what the sovereign Lord says. You are the one I spoke of in former days by my servants and prophets of Israel. At that time, they prophesied for years that I would bring you against them. This is what will happen in that day when Gog attacks the land of Israel. My hot anger will be aroused, declared the sovereign Lord. In my zeal and fiery wrath, I declare that at the, that time there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. The fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the beasts of the field, every creature that moves along the ground, and all of the people on the face of the earth will tremble at my presence. The mountains will be overturned, the cliffs will crumble, and every wall will fall to the ground. I will summon a sword against Gog on all my mountains, declares the Sovereign Lord. Every man's sword will be against his brother. I will execute judgment on him with plague and bloodshed. I will pour down torrents of rain, hailstones, and burning sulfur on him, and on his troops, and on the many nations with him. And so I will show my greatness and my holiness, and I will make myself known in the sight of many nations. Then they will know that I am the Lord. And may God grant his blessings upon the reading of the word. Wow. And as I was reading, I got some messages in here. Uh, let me see if, um, oh, okay. I wanted to check that message real quick because I was told earlier that I was having some mic problems and that would have been really bad to try to read scripture and it'd be cutting in and out. Um, 
before we go and before Amy has to head out of the studio here in just a few minutes, um, I've got more that I want to talk about, about Islam, but I want to share, and she can, I'm glad she's here to, to vouch for, for this because, um, this entire show came about since nine o'clock last night. Uh, we had a plan already in place to do a show about Paris and ISIS and the evil of Islam. But we had no guests lined up. It was just going to be me and some audio clips. And we were going to do the whole two hours. And Amy, you didn't know anything about this until actually later today, did you? Nope, I was at work. The first job I was at when I found out. And so um, you can verify that you were getting texts and messages from me that uh, just talked about how much of a God thing this was. Just multiple texts that said this was a God thing, a huge God thing. I mean, we, um, we were in the middle of working on the editing for the show, and I get a notification on my phone that Fox was breaking the news about the story in Germany that we made mention of earlier. And that was at least an hour after Marcus broke it here on our show. Right. And unfortunately we weren't live. So people will have to take my word that it was an hour before but I was interviewing him at – he was supposed to call in about 2.15. It was about almost 2.20 before he got in because he was live on the air in in Paris, France. And, and think about that, dear. A guy takes his time. I mean, do, do you think that if Trevor was to send an email to Fox News that – uh, let's see, which who, that Shepard Smith would right before he went on the air call in and let me interview him for 20 minutes. You think that might happen? Chances aren't highly likely. Not not likely at all. I mean, it's somewhere <laughs> somewhere between zero and none. Maybe. But I'm telling you, when God is involved in things, all things are possible. This guy took time right in the middle of going from one live spot, I had him for about 20 minutes. I had to, you know, some of the things were edited, uh, you know, our small talk at the beginning and, and small talk at the end that I edited out. So I had him for over 20 minutes, which was more time than what they allotted for us. And he, he was more than gracious in, in all that he did. He actually called me about a, an hour before the show just to see if he needed to to study any oh, certain wow. thing on the topic. Wow. So here I am. Uh, Trevor sent me a note. The One of the reporters from Paris is going to call you on the phone. I, all, next thing I know, I'm getting a call from Paris, France on the telephone. <laughs> and Trevor reminded me that that might be a, a long-distance cell phone call. So – when our oh, when our cell phone bill Thanks, Trevor <laughs> <laughs> and she's playing of course absolutely um um but when this guy is like making a you know he, it's one of those things I can't even hardly spit out right. there it's oh, it's so I amazing it he, was awesome he he he's making a big deal out of coming on the Ed Boston podcast. Well, it's a big deal to be on the Ed Boston podcast. Well, you're on it, so it is a big deal. Yeah, well, no, I wouldn't go that far. And then we didn't have – we didn't even – Trevor may have. I don't think he did, but he may have known the name Jeff Kinley before 9 o'clock last night. But I, I certainly didn't. 
And that all came about about his PR people wanting us to interview him about his book. Trevor sent back, we've already got a show planned for tomorrow. It fits in perfectly, but but get this, he even told them, we're not changing our topic. The topic is Paris, ISIS, and right. the evil of Islam. And so we'll ask about his book at some point in time, but is he able to come on tomorrow? And with we had him on doing the interview within just a few hours. Trevor Trevor is an awesome, awesome person and has wonderful contacts. Well, he's he's just priceless. They they've we've he and then in turn we have built up a lot of trust with the PR people because um, we we treat the guests right. Uh, We don't try to trick them and make them say things that are going to make headlines all over the world. And but you're right, and. That's how it had to be a God thing because I know that I couldn't make them kind of things happen. Trevor knows that God placed that in his hands at the very last second. Right. And he's talked with me off and on all day about how putting this together, it just, I mean, we've just both been amazed that God has, has worked in, in mighty, mighty ways. I mean, what's the odds of breaking news like that happening just before I interview the guy right? and it breaking before Fox news here in the United States. I mean, had I been on live, I would have had it broken here before Before Fox knew. And, and here I am just little old me in an upstairs bedroom studio with a microphone and a laptop and you and Trevor are my staff, <laughs> and I pay you both highly. Yeah. You no, know, they're both volunteers. And so who, who better to volunteer for? Well, I then God. Then God. That's what we do all of this for. So, um, Father God in heaven, I just thank you for being such an awesome God. You. You do things and allow things to happen on this show that that can only be because you allow to be. This show's not about me, and it's not about Amy, and it's not about Trevor. It's about you. And all three of us thank you, Father, for using us to spread your message and your gospel. Father, help us to continue to be bold and not to be afraid to tell the world that Islam is evil. Just as you told Ezekiel there about Gog coming from Magog, we may see those days here in our our lifetime. Father, you're, you're amazing, and you do amazing things. And using just Ordinary people, we just thank you for allowing us to be a part of what you have helped put together. Not what you've helped put together, but what you've led in putting together here. And you allowed us to be used by you. I thank you for all that, and I thank you for all in Jesus' name. Amen. Now... Unfortunately, Amy has got something that she's got to take care of, so you get stuck with me for the last 20 minutes of the show, and she's frowning at me. I'm not sure what that frown meant. Nothing here. <laughs> um, <laughs> give me a kiss. Thank you for all you do, and thank you, Trevor, for all you do. Well, and thank you for being willing to be a part of the show, too. I didn't have a whole lot of choice. I got thrown in. <laughs> well, you got recruited. I did. You were kind of like Daniel in the lion's den. You got put in the in the fiery furnace. Exactly. Later on, after the lion's den or before the lion's den. Or... Yeah, I didn't have a whole lot of choice. Okay. But, hey, God was with you just like he was with Daniel. And I thank you for that, too. <laughs> 
Well, I hope you don't feel like you're stuck with me for the last 20 minutes because I tell you what, this show ha has just spun by so fast. Uh, it, it, it's just amazing how it has all fit together, come together, uh, more topics to go from. Uh, we talked in the interview with Jeff about September the 11th, 2001, and, and how we seem to have almost like forgotten that that even existed. And I want to play a reminder to you of what people of the Muslim faith thought on September the 11th, 2001 atmosphere, the V sign for victory being displayed uh, in uh, East Jerusalem today among jubilant Palestinians uh, that the United States had been subject to this attack. What are we to make of that, Jennifer? Um, are we to, uh, Yasser Arafat may issue this condemnation. Look at this. We're seeing uh, people applauding, clapping, smiling, uh, happy to, to know that thousands of Americans have died in this sneak attack. And there you see a V for victory sign uh, held up to the camera. Uh, what are we to make of that? And what are we to make of what, uh, 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 about what uh, Yasser Arafat said today? The United States blamed by some Palestinians for its ongoing support as it is seen of Israel in this uh, conflict, in this Middle Eastern conflict. However, while some Palestinians were taking to the streets in apparent celebration, one youth was quoted as saying as he received a sweet, sweet handed around in celebration, this is a sweet from Osama bin Laden, he said. Hats off, Back to you. Hats off and thanks very much. We have some videotape, I understand that we're going to show you uh, from the West Bank. These are Palestinian celebrations in the wake of Tuesday's terror attacks in the United States. Pal apparently, Palestinians took to the street chanting, God is great. People were throwing candy, distributing candy to passers-by. The U.S. government obviously has become increasingly unpopular, particularly in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, because Palestinians feel that the U.S. government has sided with Israel. One man, a Nawal Abdel Fatah, wearing a long black dress, threw sweets in the air saying, actually that's a woman, pardon me, saying she was happy because, quote, America is the head of the snake. America always stands by Israel in its war against us. Meanwhile, Yasser Arafat emerged to speak with reporters. I would have a feeling that most people would say that the people that were taking to the streets, cheering, celebrating, et cetera, et cetera, were those moderate Muslims. Talking about women. If you remember, you saw children in the streets. People give him the peace sign, victory sign, V for victory. It um, something should remind you of September the 11th, 2001, every single day. And I, whether or not you believe in, in arming yourself, or or whatever it is that you believe that is best for you to protect yourself and to protect your family. I'm telling you, now is the time to do it. Now is the time to make sure that we take the promises that, that are being made by ISIS and, and – I'm sorry – and take them seriously. Um, this article up at alanwest.com, written by Michelle Jesse, associate editor, yesterday, just days after the horrific attacks in Paris, France, the Islamic State has released a new video warning that countries participating in Syrian airstrikes will face similar consequences. The video names specific targets 
including Washington, D.C., America's center, just like they struck France in the center of its abode in Paris. Uh, there was a video up from The Blaze that has since been removed. When I clicked on it, it said it violated YouTube's policies. But the transcript of it says this, quote, we say to the states that take part in the crusader campaign that by God you will have a day, God willing, like France's. And by God, as we struck France in the center of its abode in Paris, then we swear that we will strike America at its center in Washington. A man dressed in fatigues and a turban and identified in subtitles as al Garib." The Algerian said, according to Reuters, the same man also warned of more attacks in Europe. I say to the European countries that we are coming, coming with booby traps and explosives, coming with the explosive belts and gun silencers that you will be unable to stop us because today we are much stronger than before, the man said. Another man in the video who Reuters reported as identified as Al Karar, the Iraqi, had, mes had a message for French, French President Francois Holland. We have decided to negotiate with you in the trenches and not the hotels. The video, the authenticity of which was not immediately possible to verify, appeared on the site used by the Islamic State to post messages. It began with footage of the deadly terrorist attacks in Paris on Friday, which killed more than 120 people. Uh, it normally, it, the article goes on to say it takes a few days to be officially verified, uh, even though they are widely accepted as authentic. Uh, one thing we should appreciate about ISIS is that it has been direct about its intentions it's openly told us it will use the Syrian refugee crisis to import terrorists, and now it's telling us exactly where it will strike in the future. Do you think we should take him seriously? Do you think President Obama should take him seriously and not think we have him contained? This is me talking now. I'm not quoting from no article. We better take him seriously. They want to kill us. They want to kill our families. If you don't care about yourself, care about your family enough to believe that they want us dead and they want to bring harm. They want our country. I told you earlier about the organization in Plainfield, Indiana, headquarters of the, the Islamic Society of North America, the Islamic Society of North America. Field, Indiana. They have a West Coast office, Mountain View, California. They have a DC office. I, I'm on their website right now. I mean, you know, we're talking biblical times and we're reading from scripture, and God, of course, knows what he's talking about, and he knew back when he was telling those things through Ezekiel. That it would become a point in time when evil, and that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with evil. We might be talking ISIS in particular, but we're dealing with evil. Would have things at their disposal like the internet where they can root. And I don't know. I looked at at my list of people who were on Periscope earlier. And I'm telling you, there were very few names that I could pronounce. I don't know if they listened very long. I don't I don't know. But are you going to be afraid and cower? Or are you going to stand up and be ready when they come for you and yours? I know as for me and my house, we will follow the Lord. And I believe that the Lord wants us to protect ourselves and our loved ones from evil. I thought it interesting that Jeff Kinley talked about 
those that just want to pray for the evil ones. And I'm not against praying for the evil ones. I many times before he died said, wouldn't it be awesome if Osama bin Laden gave his life to Christ? But I know, the same as you know, that more than likely that is never going to happen. You can pray for it all you want to, but you're praying about something that is bigger than you. Not bigger than God, but bigger than you. We're praying about something of changing evil. And God can do that. Don't take me wrong here. God can do that. But the odds of that happening are very, very, very slim. The ones that are radicalized, the ones that they call radical Islam, it's about like the odds of a pedophile not being a pedophile. You can pray for them. You can love them. You can... You can do whatever it is you think you ought to do, but I'm telling you, you better not trust them around your kids. Can God perform miracles? Every day he can perform miracles. But every day evil prevails in this world. And it's not going to get better, folks. It's not going to get better. It's going to continue Throughout the end of time, we, we read about tribu- the time of tribulation. Our illustrious president decided that he would – let's see if I can find the right link here. He decided that in uh, his speech over in uh, Turkey, I believe is where they are. And talking about the refugee situation that – and this is a direct quote. We don't have religious tests to compassion. We do not not close our hearts to the victims of such violence and somehow start equating the issue of refugees with the issue of terrorism. Again, just days after Paris happened. And guess what? Here's the first part of the article. Debate over Syrian immigrants continued to escalate Monday in the wake of Paris terrorist attacks, which appeared to have been carried out in part by two or maybe three terrorists who stuck into France through the refugee program. Remember the M&M scenario I said earlier? The people that say that, well, there's only 10% of of them that are bad? It only took two or three to be a part of what happened in Paris. And governors have started to stand up and say no to the refugees. And House Republicans are planning to block funding for them. Some Republicans suggest we focus on allowing only Syrian refugees who are Christian. Well, I don't know about all of that, but what I do know is that the president said – that we have no test, religious test to our compassion. However, Breitbart is reporting that despite President Obama's sanctimonious proclamation Monday that America does not have a religious test when it comes to admitting refugees into America, the actual math appears to show the complete opposite is true. According to CNS News, who looked at the data Only 53 Syrian Christian refugees have been allowed into America compared to 2,098 Syrian Muslims. Breitbart's article goes on with, While everyone of every faith is suffering in the civil war in Syria that has been further complicated by the successful creation of his an Islamic state throughout much of the country, there is no question that Syrian Christians have been singled out for the worst kind of persecution under ISIS, including mass beheadings that do not discriminate against innocent women and even small children. There, Mr. President, they discriminate The Christians get the worst treatment. Shame.
shame on you, Mr. President, for acting like this is just business as usual. It's not business as usual. We're at war. And we're going to be at war in our own streets because you have no clue what you're doing or you're part of the problem. Yes, I'm upset. Ever since this France thing, I've not been in the greatest of moods. And there might have been some other things that, that affected that somewhat. But I'm just telling you, this Paris thing has affected me personally. Not because I knew anybody in particular, but because I realized that, that we are in the face of – we're looking evil straight in the face. And we've got people that are looking them straight in the face thinking – in saying that, well, there's just 10% of the bad ones. Well, I didn't even get done with all of the things I had here. Before I go, I want to remind you that uh, uh, I am out and about doing different things. This is won't take much time here. Hey, this is Ed from Ed Boston Ministries. Wanted to let everyone know that I'm taking bookings for speaking engagements, Sunday church services, extended numbers of services or revival, individual groups, or really just about any event you would like to invite me to. Just email me at bookings at edboston.com. Looking forward to hearing from you. God bless and go out and do the right thing. All right, we're seconds away from the show ending. I thank you so much for being with me. Check us out, ed at edboston.com. From there, go to all of our social media. Share this podcast with people. This is this was a good one, and I, you know, I don't say that to brag on myself. It, it just was a good one because God was in control, and the Holy Spirit led this podcast. For Amy, for Trevor, who is awesome, and I, I'll never be able to repay all for all he does. This is Ed. Go out and do the right thing. God bless.